3. The Apostle Paul, in this section of the letter, we've been apart from it for a little while now, is dealing with that thing that he seemed to have to deal with all of the time concerning the churches that he planted, and that was that false teachers would follow him into these churches and try and draw the hearts of the people away from a grace-based relationship with God, and that means that God saves us as a free gift. And then God deals with us from the point of salvation on the basis of grace and forgiveness. And I'm convinced that the hardest thing in the world for a person to do who's been truly born again is to sin against grace, to sin against love. It's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance, the Bible says. And these legalistic teachers would come in and say, no, no, God doesn't deal with man on the basis of grace or these kinds of things. He deals with you on the basis of works. And they had, of course, their own unique setup, depending on what sect they were a part of, for what works did please God. And typically they became enriched uh, as a part of that. The Apostle Paul, in essence, declared earlier in chapter 3 that in terms of self-righteousness, in terms of man-made religion and through our own works trying to establish a right standing before God, he said, I have excelled like no one else I know in life. And I have the unique advantage of being able to have risen to the very top of those institutions, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. And yet when I came to the day where I began a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and a righteousness put to my account, not earned, but given to me as a gift, and now I have the glory of spending all of this life and the life to come as one of response to what God has first done to me. And he said, all I can say is to compare the one to the other is to compare perfection and beauty with garbage, with dung with refuse. That's how distant the two are from one another. And then Paul describes all of the things that he gained in Christ that he never gained in all of his years of, of religion. He declared in verse 9, I gained a superior righteousness. In verse 10, I have a real personal relationship with God that's steady and abiding in a relationship that religion never gave me. In verse 10, I have the power of His resurrection. Religion gave me all of these rules. I couldn't keep the rules. God has laid out the standard of His Word through Christ, and, and He's given me the power now to keep His Word. And then He said in verse 10, I counted a privilege to suffer for God. In religion, it was something to be endured, suffering, in order to, you know, attain to something. I love to suffer in fellowship with Him. And then in verse 10, He said, I'm being conformed into to His death. Day by day, I'm growing in my surrender to the Father. A surrender not on the basis of works or on the basis of guilt or condemnation or fear or these things that religion uses. But I see the beauty of surrender in my Savior's life to the Father and to His will. And I long for the fullness of that for my own life. And then in verse 11 he says, I have what religion can never provide. I have the confidence of everlasting life, the confidence of heaven. And then in verse 11 again I have that knowledge that all of this ends in, in heaven, and not only ends in heaven, but ends with an eternal reward for my faithfulness to God here. Religion has always got you wondering whether you're going to make it to heaven, much less whether there will be a reward for you. And so Paul says, in essence, don't waste your time with legalism and all of that kind of stuff and laws and man-made religion and all of that kind of stuff. It can't compare to what we have in Christ and we come now to verse 12. And Paul anticipates the objection of the legalist. Again, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knows what they're going to think before they think it. And he knows the objection of the legalist toward the teacher like Paul or the teaching of the New Testament is that if you teach people 
that they have those things freely in Christ. That He just gives righteousness to people. That He gives a perfect righteousness. That they can know as an absolute fact that one day they're going to be in heaven. And as they walk with the Lord, be rewarded in heaven. If you tell people those kinds of things, what you're going to do is you're going to produce weak people. You're going to produce people who are self-satisfied. They'll just become lazy. They won't serve the Lord. You've got to use guilt and condemnation, and you've always got to have them just slightly worried about whether they've done enough or they're saved or something. I know people, that's how you've got to do that with them. And Paul said, no. When a person truly trusts and understands the love of God for, that, for them, and what God has provided enormous expense to himself, that person will never become self-satisfied and will never become a lazy Christian. It will be his joy and her joy to grow and grow and grow in Christ-likeness until the day they see him face to face and are fully like him, short of divinity. And that's what he begins to say here in verse 12. Don't think it will produce lax Christians. Paul said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also uh, laid hold of me. And in there in verse 12, it's worth circling. The, Paul says, I press. He says, I, that I may lay hold. Then in verse 13, reaching forward. And the idea is, is that sprinters, the Olympics are coming up this summer, as they just lean as hard as they can into that tape. And then again in verse 14, I press. Paul said, don't tell me that this produces a lax Christian, a self-satisfied life. Someone who just looks and says, well, I got saved and all I wanted was so much fire insurance and, and I don't care about anything else. Paul says, I know nothing of that. You notice in verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. By the time Paul writes this epistle, he has been saved for 30 years. <laughs> How many of you in this room have been saved for 30 or more years? Just raise your hand. He's been saved, thank you. For 30 years, and he has been actively serving the Lord as an apostle for 25 years. Do you think about all that he has done, all the churches that he has planted, how he served God at tremendous sacrifice? And we read the epistles that the Holy Spirit writes through him, and we are in, you know, in, in a sanctified awe of of who he was and what he was in his maturity. But even after 30 years, he said, I'm not perfect yet. <laughs> he said, I, I, I haven't apprehended or I'm not already perfected. I'll tell you, that gives me hope. Have you noticed it in our walk with the Lord? I am learning so much in my relationship with the Lord that each week... That the Sunday comes, and my, my life is measured in weeks, Sundays. But each Sunday, I mean, I'm like a new person. I've learned so much that week. It may not be apparent, but so the learning curve is so steep. Always the learning going on. God always teaching us these things. And, and there isn't that laxness I've apprehended, you know, and now we just live off of the glory of the past or, 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 or whatever. And I'm so glad that Paul wasn't perfect yet after 30 years. It gives me hope because I'm so far short of perfection. Now, there is a doctrine that exists today in, in a particular denomination, but even beyond the denomination, and it's the doctrine of sinless perfection. That when a person comes to Christ, that they no longer sin. They're perfect. Well, obviously, Paul knew nothing of this. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. But I, he said, I don't use that as an excuse. Oh, well, you know, I mean, um, I, I'm not perfect yet, but uh, that's God's problem or something like that. He said, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. When Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, he recognized that a lot more happened on that road to Damascus than just his salvation, as important as that was. 
But he realized that he had been saved not merely to escape the fires of hell, but that God had saved him for a purpose. God had a plan to use his life for certain uh, purposes. And here he talks about uh, laying hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me beyond salvation. Paul recognized that it's great I'm saved, but God has a hold on my life for his purposes. And still, after all of these years, he's pressing, pressing on to fulfill what God has called him to do and to be in his life. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. <laughs> he wants to make that clear, doesn't he? But he said, one thing I do. And he's got my attention. Thirty years in the Lord. Twenty-five years as an apostle. Shipwreck. Beatings beyond number. All of the trials and all of the things that he's been through. All You think about all he's seen and all he's heard and all he knows. I mean, sometimes I look at Pastor Chuck Smith that way. Think about, you go way back, you think about Maranatha music starting. You think about that tent and you think about the early church. The whole world has been impacted by how God has graciously used one man. And I look at him and I think, what has he seen? What has he heard? What has he felt between him and God? And I think the same thing and even more related to the Apostle Paul. And so when he says, after 30 years, he reduces things down to one thing, he's got my attention. What's this one thing, you know, that you do, Paul? And he said, here it is, forgetting those things that are behind. In order to do what? To reach forward to those things which lie ahead. And the imagery is running a race. And no one can run at full strength forward who is looking behind or is uh, obsessed with what's behind them. And, and for our purposes, it would be our past. And Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. I remember when the big wind of doctrine was going through and the body of Christ many years ago, and it ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, and the, great, the big thing was inner healing taking people back into their past and back into their trauma in Christian circles, taking them back into this event, and back into that event, and taking them back all the way to their childhood and reliving and now see Jesus there and all of this going back. And to save my life in the light of Philippians chapter 3, I said, why this experimentation upon God's people? When Paul said, this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. And I leave those things in God's hand. And I trust in his promise in Romans 8.38 where he talks about working all things together for good. He doesn't call all things good. But I don't have to relive them to make them good. I'll trust him to work those things together for good. And I'm never to allow my, not only other people to take me into the past... But to go there myself, it'll paralyze us. It'll paralyze us as it would the Apostle Paul with either condemnation over the failure in our past or with a glorious past, the pride that would come. You think about Paul and the necessity for him to take his eyes off of what was behind him even yesterday and keep his focus forward on what God had called him to. What a glorious history he had. All of the churches that he had planted, all of the people that had come to know the Lord, all these great things that he did. If everyone, anyone could have sat down and written his autobiography, you know, uh, the, uh, you know a man of faith or whatever kind of a... He, he could have done it and just, you know, rested in his laurels and been lifted up in pride and said, you know, as soon as somebody else uh, tops what it is that I have done or God has done through me, then I'll start to run once again. But he didn't do that. Because the standard for success in his life was not what anybody else did or didn't do. The standard was what had God called him to do. And that may be different for everyone else. So he said, I don't look back. I don't want to be tempted by the pride 
It'll be enough to go into glory and to receive reward for faithfulness. But you think about Paul and what he was and what he did prior to coming to know the Lord, and it would be enough to silence anyone. Where anyone, even after the great history that he has as an apostle, to look and say, where the devil could come and say, how in the world could you ever open your mouth in any public setting concerning Christ? After what you were as a part of the Sanhedrin, after you took and cast votes to imprison men and women for a simple faith in Christ, as you voted even for their death and you held the garments of the men that stoned Stephen to death before your very eyes and you witnessed every stone and you heard every single sickening thud of the stones and how the devil could pound him and silence him over his past. So Paul said, I leave all of it with God because I can't run forward in what God has called me to do and to be and be looking backward. And it's a good thing for us to do. Leave those things, forgetting those things which are behind in order that we might reach forward to the things that are ahead. He said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And what was the goal? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. As you see the words, I press, I lay hold, reaching forward, I press. Paul said, no, a response to grace does not produce a self-satisfied person, much less a self-satisfied Christian. It produces this. And Paul said, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And he knows the great tendency for someone to come along and say, yeah, you know, forgetting the things that are behind and pressing forward and all. How convenient for you to believe that. What a way to, you know, cop out and take away, you know, the responsibility of your past and your actions and, and, and all of this, you know, and, and, and how it, it, it could be attacked. And Paul said, no. It isn't a sign of immaturity. It isn't a sign of, of, a, of, a, of a, a lack of desire for godliness. It's a sign of maturity. Therefore, let us, as many as mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. In other words, never feel guilty for leaving the past in God's hands and trusting Him to work it together for good and never view it as a cop-out, a tremendous price. Here are the symbols of His body and His blood. A tremendous price was paid for us to be able to move forward as a new creation from the things that we once were and that we once did. And he said, brethren, join in following my example. And, and, and his example in rejecting legalism and, and, and giving his full heart to the grace that is in Christ and his example in forgetting the things that are, are behind and reaching forward as a, as a Christian that's always growing. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk, that walk the same. Paul said, I'm not the only one that's, way, that, that's like this. And note others that are like this as you have us for a pattern. He said, for many walk, so follow us, our example, not these false teachers. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping, and now he speaks of the legalists, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That's what a legalist is. Self-righteousness, this idea that I can work my way to heaven, or this idea that I am saved by believing in Jesus and anything else. Paul says anyone that says anything about salvation that adds the slightest work to what Christ has done for us on the cross, he says they are enemies of the cross. I'll tell you that's a needed clarity. Needed clarity today. No matter how nice, no matter how moral, no matter how kind, no matter how what. 
if anyone teaches that that cross needs to be added to for salvation, that person is an enemy of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, eternal destruction. Those are the stakes. Now he speaks in verse 19 of the libertines, and we'll get into more of this in Colossians next week. But there was the legalists, but then there were the other people who look and said, well, you know, uh, God is gracious and, and uh, you know, he saves everybody and it doesn't really matter what we believe or what we do or this kind of thing and it doesn't matter if we sin. God just overlooks all of that and, and he, he doesn't have a problem with it and all. And so Paul warns concerning this group too. And he says, whose God is their belly, they're dominated by the appetites of the flesh, and whose glory is in their shame. They use grace as an excuse to sin. Paul was completely intolerant of that too, and who set their mind on earthly things. Now, in contrast to those people, Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven. We don't set our mind on the things of the earth supremely. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, the interesting thing about the uh, Philippi is Philippi was a, 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 a town in, in the Roman government that was just r this Roman kind of town where they would take and when uh, military officers would retire and this kind of thing, they would go to Philippi or other cities of, of this kind. And it was basically just a little piece of Rome far away from Rome. And, and so, uh, you know, to have uh, to be a citizen in, uh, of the Roman Empire, you know, and then to go to Philippi there and, and uh, uh, you had tremendous privileges there in Philippi by virtue of your Roman citizenship. They knew the advantages of being a Roman citizen in Philippi. And Paul said, listen, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. That word eagerly is nice. It means to be up on your tiptoes looking for Him. I'll tell you, I'm on my tiptoes looking for Him. I got a phone call uh, yesterday from a very, very good friend and his wife. And his wife is... Uh, diagnosed with something very, very serious. And this is something that is common, common in this body. And as these things begin to play out, and is God going to heal or is He not going to heal, and these, these different kinds of, of things. On these, and I just look and I say, Come tonight, Lord. Come tonight. I'm eagerly waiting for Your return. So there are no more victims of this fallen world. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. And this, if you don't know that your body is lowly yet, it's because you're under 35. Uh, but you'll learn. But one day He's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. He said these false teachers, their end is destruction. They set their minds on the things of the world. Don't follow them. Look at what our portion is to be able to set our minds on the things of heaven, the noble things of God, God's salvation, His forgiveness a new creation, a, a, a eternal reward, eternity with God. These are the things that we have in Christ. Don't trade those things in for what these false teachers are bringing. And God doesn't just promise these things. He doesn't promise a new body. He doesn't merely promise heaven for us. It's in our future. More sure than the chairs that you're sitting in, I am going to stand in heaven. And I'm going to stand on that glassy throne and I am going to be in the full image of Christ. And I am going to be there forever and ever and ever. And it's sure in a way that religion can never make that sure. It's sure because Christ has provided it as a gift. What are you going to trade that in for? <laughs> a Buick? And therefore, in light of this, he said... 
My beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. He says, I tell you these things because I love you. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Don't let anyone move you from the Lord. Maybe that's something for someone here tonight. Maybe they've come with their suits to your front door. Or maybe somebody's come, a friend or a family member or something, and they're pulling you off into some, or trying to, into some legalistic thing. And we're so prone to it. Why does Paul have to fight even uh, for God's people to, to remind us of the fact that it's grace? Why is there that natural tendency towards legalism? I'll tell you why. Because we know that we deserve judgment. And there is something as a result within us that thinks that we must suffer in a relationship with God or we're not doing it right. But that's our thinking. That's man's way of thinking. That's not God's way of thinking, nor his provision. And so Paul begs them. He says, you stick with the Lord. Stay with the Lord, my beloved. And then he said, I implore uh, you, Odia, and I equally implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And here are the two women that have brought some kind of conflict between the two of them that is damaging the witness of the church of of Philippi in the city of Philippi and threatening the very stability of the church. And Paul takes and he names them by name in the letter. Now, can you imagine? There you are at the city of Philippi and... and, uh, Epaphroditus comes back and he's got the letter that Paul has written and everything and it gets announced on the Sunday morning services. They didn't quite have it like that, but um, they typically have Sundays off. And, uh, and so it gets announced and the, the Sunday evening service, we're going to read, Paul's going to read the letter, you know, and as he's starting to go through and he's talking about Christ and the mind of Christ and servanthood and love one another and all of these kinds of things, you know, they've got to be kind of starting to sink down in their seat a little bit, you know, as as he's clearly addressing the conflict that they're a part of. And then now, as it's being read out loud, all of a sudden their names are just brought right out into the middle of the room like two gigantic, uh, you know, green frogs. And Paul, he doesn't blink to do it because of the necessity of it. And, And the possibility of two people, whatever their sex, Digging in in some kind of a dispute with one another. And they begin to work the congregation to get one side on their side and the other part on their side and all. And everyone can look at it and say, that's going to tear that body right down the middle. And they will get so dug in that they will say, I don't care what happens to the witness of Christ or the future of this church in the city of Philippi, I am going to win this fight. And Paul said, all right, if that's the attitude, I feel free to identify you by name and to shock you before the whole church. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Have the mind of Christ, the mind of a servant for one another. Treat the body of Christ and the work of the Lord in the same way that he would treat it. And then he said, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel and Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he says, now he he exposes them and he exhorts them publicly, but then he realizes this situation has, has gone out of control, so to speak, and these two women clearly need help in resolving this problem. And he calls on a leader that he doesn't identify here, they apparently knew, to come alongside these two women and help this thing get solved. Enough is enough here. But he speaks of the two women. They're very experienced, influential women in the church. They'd labored with Paul in the gospel, perhaps a part of of establishing the church right there in Philippi. Their names written in the book of life. They're going to be in heaven together forever. They're going to shoot every bullet before they get there. 
And then Paul begins a series of exhortations as he closed the letter in verse 4. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I don't think there is anything in the body of Christ that so saps joy than conflict in the body of Christ. I hate it. <laughs> it pulls something out of your life that is so deep and so hard to replenish back into your life. And so Paul calls on the church to turn away from this split that's occurred and the division and all. And he says, return to rejoicing in the Lord. Might not be able to rejoice in the circumstance or whatever it is, but we can always rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the fact that you're saved. Rejoice in the fact that He's made us a new creation. Rejoice in the fact that He's given us the power to live a different kind of life. Rejoice in the fact that He's given us a new identity in Christ. Rejoice in the fact that one day we'll be in heaven. So much to rejoice in, in Christ. And then one conflict arises and we lose sight of all of it. So He tells us, He says, rejoice in the Lord. And then that last word, always. And it is only in Him that we can always rejoice. Because who and what He is and what He provides us is always a constant. So there's always a reason for joy in our life. Because of Him and what He provides. And then He says, and I love it, Paul knows people, God knows people. And He said, and again, I will say, rejoice. Now here's how this works. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's a command. Now, how many of us in this room don't shout out? You might end up on the tape. But, I mean, here we are. We're able to read this, a clear command. Rejoice in the Lord always. And it doesn't move us at all. <laughs> we're still dug in in some fight or we're still, you know, glum about whatever and, and all. And, and as if... As if there was no verse 4 in the whole Bible. And Paul knows our capacity to just read these things and just consider it to be sermon fodder. And also he comes back and says, By the way, remember, I said, again, rejoice. And I was just talking. Think about who you are and what you have in Christ. And celebrate that in your heart right now. He said, Let your gentleness be known to all men. People notice gentleness, don't they? That yielding, that spirit of yielding in our life. And obviously with this fight that's going on there in Philippi, there's a lack of gentleness, a lack of a willingness to yield. Not to false teaching, but to another person. Say, all right, I yield to you on that. It's not worth a fight. I won't damage the body over it. I yield to you in it. And so he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? Because the world watches us. And they'll watch us when we fight. And they'll watch us equally when we're gentle. Paul said to the church of Philippi, Calvary Chapel, Modesto, every church in the world, to be known for gentleness. Let that be what people see. For the Lord is at hand. The gentle one is coming. And we will love to have been gentle once we stand in His presence. He said, be anxious for nothing. Now, nothing is a big word, isn't it? It's fairly all-encompassing. He says, be anxious for nothing. Now, the interesting thing about worry is that it doesn't accomplish anything, does it? <laughs> Somebody has said, and it's one of my favorite quotes concerning worry, is it's, it's like a rocking in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it, it doesn't get you anywhere. And that's the truth, isn't it? It takes up a lot of time, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And I remember one time years ago, there was a, a, a teacher in the community that I was in, and he had come up with a great idea for how Christians were to deal with worry. He, he had given up, obviously, on the fact that anyone could be a Christian and not worry. He said, all right, here's what you do. You set up a worry time. Just set it up, and, and uh, sometime maybe in the evening, you know, 7.45 or whatever it might be, and any time you're tempted to worry during the day, just remind yourself, I'll worry about it at 7.45. 
It's tremendous, isn't it? <laughs> but that's not how God wants us to deal with worry. One man had a solution. Again, it's one of my favorites. He said, the best way to forget something that you're prone to worry about is to wear a pair of tight shoes. <laughs> Equally brilliant, isn't it? Well, God, so, but we look and say, all right, there's the command, be anxious for nothing. Well, that frees up a tremendous amount of time for some of us. And so what, what should we do rather than worry? Notice that word, but, instead... In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Instead of worrying, take whatever it is that we're concerned about to prayer to the Lord and lift it up to Him. Say, Lord, I'm worried about this. Lord, I know the birds of the air, you're going to feed them. And, and I know the lilies of the field, you're going to take care of them. And all. I'm, I'm worried about this bill that's coming. I'm worried about this medical diagnosis that's happened here. I'm worried about whether we're going to be able to afford the health insurance through the way that things are, or workman's comp is going to put me out of business. or what. I'm worried about these things, Lord. I'm worried about my children, Lord. And it's completely unproductive. But when it will translate into prayer, now all of a sudden we're impacting the situation. It, we're having an effect upon the situation by our prayer. So he said, instead of worrying, forget about tight shoes, give yourself to prayer. And, and, and supplication, ask for specific things. Don't forget to mix in a little thanksgiving with it. Remember all the things that are going good and all the blessings that you have. And then, and then let them know what your requests are. Oh, I couldn't request anything of God. Listen, get off that. Just let, let it, what are your requests and let him know what that is. And then give him the freedom to say yes or no, but to lift it up to him. And then what will be the promised result of lifting these things up in prayer? And the peace of God. How peaceful is God? I think he's a wreck up there. Oh, my. You know. Foghorn, leghorn, back and forth and back and forth, you know. No, he's very, very peaceful. He said, you lift these things up to me in prayer. And I will replace your worry with my peace. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It doesn't come with figuring the problem out or anything like that. It is a supernatural peace that comes from God. It will guard, it will set itself up literally as a guard around our hearts to protect us from worry and our minds through Christ Jesus. And it's true, isn't it? In our own lives, we're taken, we're worried about something and frantic about it and all. And, and then we sit down and we say, okay, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to get up until I have cast my cares on you, knowing that you care for me. And we lift these things up to him. It was specifically and individually, just as he, he says here, supplications and prayer and, and every way that we know of to say, Lord, here, I give, I give this to you. Lord, I look to you to work in this situation. And then we get up and what happened? The way the world's been lifted off of us. We're changed. God's peace has been planted into our heart. It's true. He's faithful to it. He said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. So much for primetime television. <laughs> but as a Christian, we are to determine what we set our minds on. No other person, no television network, no radio show, no anything, no newspaper, no this, no anything in this world is to determine what we set our minds upon. We determine what we set our minds upon. And it's possible to waste the mind, to waste it every day of my life, 
if it isn't set as a Christian upon the things that God has intended for a mind to be set upon. And when a mind is set on what God knows, a mind has been created to be set on the things of Him, how it transforms a life. So Paul says, listen, meditate on these things. Make these the things that you're constantly thinking about in, in your life. We're going to think about things in life. Every, every waking minute of every one of our lives, we're thinking. We're going to meditate on something. Paul says, set your mind on these things. And the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the peace of God will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. And Paul returns now to this whole subject, one of the main reasons that he wrote the letter uh, to the Philippians, and that was to thank them for an offering that they had sent to him and some money. And in those days when you were in prison, in those Roman prisons, they didn't supply you with uh, necessarily with food or, or televisions or these different kinds of things and all, or clothing. When you went in to prison, it, you were dependent upon your loved ones outside of the prison to supply you with food and clothing if you had any desire to stay healthy because it was just gruel otherwise. And this church, when they heard that Paul was in prison, they sent an offering, a financial gift, and this was not a, a wealthy church to make sure that his needs were being attended to. They had received so much from Paul. They said, now here he is in a time of need. What, what, Paul would never ask for anything. You have to look to help these kinds of people this way. And here is a chance to really bless him. And, and we're going to do it. And you notice that in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your f care for me has flourished again. That offering, whatever the dollar amount was that they sent to him, that financial gift that expressed their heart toward him, Paul said, I rejoiced in it. It, it elevated, it lifted his heart. It blessed him in the middle of his trial. And he said, thank you. He said that once again you've sent to help me. And so they had apparently sent money to him at least twice. He said, sure, though surely you did care, but you lacked opportunity. So the time that was between the first time that they sent a gift to him and the time in which the second gift was, was sent, Paul said, I understand that that didn't represent a lack of care on your part toward me. I, I, I know that it, it, it represented a, a, a lack of opportunity. Paul was a tough guy to keep uh, up with. <laughs> I mean, he's in prison over here in Caesarea, and then he's headed towards Rome, and he gets shipwrecked, and he's liable to spend a winter on any old island that he's going to get shipwrecked on, and, and then over here and here. And, I mean, it could take a while for a traveler's check to catch up to him. And, and so Paul said, you lacked opportunity. But apparently when they found out where he was, they sent to help him. And Paul said he didn't want to be misunderstood and say, well, you know, here I'm closing the letter. Boy, that was sure a great offering that you sent to me and all. And uh, uh, hint, hint, I uh, was, well, you know, and my shoes are getting a little bit worn out or this kind of, he's not dropping a hint for another offering. He said, not that I speak in regard to need. I'm not telling you thank you to try and get something more from you. He said, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, now that, that is a wealthy man or woman in this world. Is, is one who's content. I mean, you look, watch, look at this world, how people are just fried trying to more and more and this and distinct and, and all this kind of... You know, uh, we were on our way back from, uh, from uh, Israel and, and we stopped in England and it's, and it's all wonderful. I'm not meaning to nitpick on anything. But you, we went into a couple of places where there... You, you ever see these stores that you go into? I've, I've been into uh, or I've seen one of them in Hawaii. I don't go in. There's no sense in, in, in it for me. But, but you, you look in the window and you, you think it's out of business. There's like... One lady in there and like four dresses. You say, how do they pay the rent and keep the lights on and, and uh, pay that woman to be there and to sell this thing? And then they got four dresses and three purses in the place. And then you go in and the, they're, you know, $3,500 each or $35,000 each. You say, oh, that's how that works, you know. 
There's only five of them in the whole world of these dresses. And, and people buy them to, it, it, because, you know, they're looking for fulfillment in the next thing, the next thing, somehow to make myself distinctive from the rest of the population and, and all of, of these things. And this will be the thing. One of only, there's only five of those dresses in existence, and it could be a suit. Don't, ladies, don't write me. But uh, men are as vain as, as any, anyone else. You know, I, my Botox and <laughs> Botox. Tuck's treatments. I hope there are no. Do you notice them at all? Any of this? So I'm working on the liver spots. I don't know what. I, it's costing me a fortune. I'm telling you. But anyway, uh, back to the text. You'll be happy to uh, have me return there. But there's just this frenzy. And when someone just looks and says, "You know, I'm content. I'm content with whatever God has for me." You realize that's a rich person, even in the body of Christ. He said, but notice that it's not something that's automatic. Paul said, I had to learn this. I had to learn it. I think we all have to learn that. He said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Well, how does a person learn that? He tells us in verse 12, I know how to be abased. I know how to have nothing. And I know how to abound. I know how to have a lot. And everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. And it takes both to learn contentment. I know what it is to be full and I know what it is to be hungry. I know both how it is to abound and to suffer need. I know what it is in life to be hungry, to suffer need. I know all of those things and to be in God's will and to experience it. I know how to have more than I could ever have and use for myself. And I have in in both of those experiences as a part of my life, he said, I've learned to be content. And, And how so? He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said... I have been in both circumstances, and in both circumstances, I have found God, Christ, to be completely faithful to me. And there is a certain kind of grace and faithfulness that is needed from God toward us when we are abounding. That is, it can be a very spiritually dangerous condition in life. And there is something that we need Christ to be and a strength in our life when we are going hungry and we have necessity. And Christ will be all of that to us in either circumstance, no matter what it looks like. And and we look at the circumstance, Jesus looks at it and he's not troubled by it at all. He said, I've got the grace for it. I know exactly what to add to that to get them through. And at the same time, to teach them to be content in me. And whatever I provide. Now, this is a, a difficult verse here. Now, this verse uh, 12, um, as it talks about this, because you think about that whole positive confession thing that is as big as it today as it's ever been. Where everybody is, every Christian ought to be wealthy. Every Christian ought to be, you know, flawlessly healthy and this kind of thing. And here is the Apostle Paul, and he speaks of times where he was hungry and he suffered need. I tell you, I don't buy that doctrine at all, and I don't have time to go into it beyond that. I can do all things, Paul said, through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well that you've shared in my distress. You know, people, they could look at it and say, well, you know, if you put it like that, I mean, did we offend you by sending the gift? Paul said, no, the gift is appreciated. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, When I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you alone. Isn't that amazing? Out of all the churches that the Apostle Paul established, only the church of Philippi sent him offerings. And they only did it twice. I mean, how thankless, how thankless could his service to the Lord, I mean, be? But, I mean, it's really an example. Paul, was, Paul did not serve the Lord out of money. He was not in it for the money. But even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not for my Rolls Royce, but for my necessities. 
Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. He said, when I receive the gift from you, I'm not asking you to supply, but I'm glad for the eternal reward that will be yours for having given to the work of the Lord that I'm involved in. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And Paul is saying, when you sent that offering to me, he said, you gave it to God first and foremost. And you gave it to me secondarily. And that's how God saw the offering. And it was a sweet fragrance unto God. On Sunday mornings when we receive the offering, you notice that it's always phrased the same way. At this time, let's continue our worship of the Lord by receiving this morning's tithes and offerings. We never say, by taking an offering. We don't take offerings around here. We receive offerings that are made unto the Lord. And because we recognize this is being given to God and we want it to be a fragrance to Him. No constraint. It's an honor and a privilege to give to Him and His work. Then Paul gives them the promise, and it is a promise to all givers. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that's a promise to givers. You know, early in the history of the church here, um, having recognized that verse and, and some other things, I thought... I don't want Calvary Chapel of Modesto to be this, like, independent thing over here, just, you know, all by itself. And and what I want to do is I want to be this church to be interconnected with a body of Christ, a larger body of Christ. And so we began in, in small ways initially, but we began it and, and began to support missions and Christian work in the community and then around the world and these kinds of things so that we would be networked in with the rest of the body of Christ. But also to recognize that God will never allow a giver their needs to not be met. And, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably terribly carnal, uh, what I've uh, uh, confessed to you here. But <laughs> let's have this be a church that's giving out from it. And then where God, you know, can't afford to have us go under. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm a, I'm a Jacob through and through apart from the Lord. It wasn't all that base. I mean, I had some noble motives in there. I'm telling you, I'm growing every week. Didn't I tell you that earlier in the message already? But to be connected, to say, I want to be that way, because this is the promise to give us. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And now, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And you can imagine as they're all uh, sitting there listening to the letters, uh, letter and all, and Paul says, listen, greet every one of the saints there in, in, in Philippi. Greet them in Christ for me. And I mean, how that must have blessed them. Paul greeted me. And the brethren who are with me, they greet you, and all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. And so in Caesar's household and among his servants... People were coming to know the Lord under uh, Paul's ministry and his imprisonment. Paul said, they greet you especially. And then Paul commends them to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And there's nothing that you can commend people to better than that, than the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, I commend you to your own good works and hope you get to heaven. No, no. He said, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's the truth. So be it. If the men will come forward that are going to serve communion tonight, that would be great in the worship team also. We're going to partake of communion and uh, we'll partake of the bread first and then later of the cup when it's passed out. Uh, Hold the bread and we will.